giving me the lottery commission, and I'll, I'll trim a lot of fat off of that. And that's why I wanted to be involved. And I think that's true of, of, of most of our agencies and programs. You know, the bureaucracy, the overhead, the inefficiencies, money just thrown everywhere for whatever reason. And I think that the Texas, Texas state needs to be more fiscally responsible for the windfall of revenues that we take in. The reason that I that I'm running for office is uh, I have a nonprofit. Uh, aside from my day job, I also, also have a night and weekend job as well. And it's a nonprofit called Survivors of Childhood Sex Abuse. And we started about four or five years ago. And um, there was a bill in Louisiana um, that we supported, and it eliminated the statute of limitations for sex crimes against children. It also provided a three-year legislative look-back window. And Louisiana being you know, a Catholic state, I'm like, there's no way this is ever going to pass. And I was kind of skeptical, and I do have egg on, on my face today, but it passed unanimously the first time. Uh, and it, it was just an incredible victory. Um, so we thought, well, let's do it in Texas as well. And it had been put forth before the legislature twice that I know of. I was involved in the second attempt and it, it didn't even make it out of committee. It died there. And, you know, Texas is really um, big to promote how much they care about children. So I, I don't know, I just left a sour taste in my mouth. And at the very last moment, I decided to run. That's my want, my wish. That was the catalyst for me filing. I did so at the last moment. I couldn't find anybody else to, to pick it up, pick up the effort. So that's why I'm running. So I know a lot about the, the border. I, I've, uh, as a young man, I own a business in Matamoros, Mexico, uh, right across from Brownsville. Uh, with the state guard, I deployed to the border. As a director for Cisco Systems, uh, my territory was all of Latin America. I've been to every Mexican border town at least two or three times. And, and, you, and you see a lot there, especially when you're invested uh, from a business perspective. You know, there are dreamers that come from Mexico looking for a better life. And my wife is one of those dreamers. And, you know, she came from Durango, Mexico, and uh, she had a dream. She wanted to be a nurse, and now she is. Uh, she's like a, a textbook case on, on when immigration works right. The reason I believe that the dreamers come through illegally is because the federal immigration system is severely broken. It's very protracted in nature. It takes many, many, many years to, to be able to come from Mexico to become a citizen. So, you know, um, just look at our history, you know. Well, I'll just take the easy road. I'll come illegally and some president will come along in a couple of years and give me asylum. I think that's what, what they believe. Uh, and they're good people. There's, not there. I love them. That they're great. But there's also other issues on the border. You know, everybody knows about this. It's the the cartels. You know, it's uh, and it's got only gotten worse over time. The cartels, China is involved in that to an extent now. You know, fentanyl is killing our our children. You know, and, and our people as well. And it's it's opium war scenario where Great Britain, England would send opium to China to dumb down the population and then steal their natural resources. So China learned a lesson and they're doing it to us now. And so uh, at first we made a big diplomatic stink about it and that slowed it down for a little bit. But now China is they're importing the precursors, not importing them into Mexico, but smuggling the precursors into Mexico. And the cartels are now synthesizing the precursors into fentanyl. And and they're everything that they smuggle across the border is tainted with it. And and the death toll is just is staggering. It's a very, very dangerous drug. It's very, very strong. Actually, there's a legal fentanyl in the United States that goes under a brand name of Dorogesic, and they just, they, it's dedicated to cancer patients. You know, that's how tightly it's controlled. And then carfentanil is next, which is even more powerful than fentanyl. So, you know, we, we, we always had cartel problems on the border, but it's getting worse and worse and worse. And we have to protect against that.
Um, th there's also, you know, a man in the Middle East that uh, has a fake Canadian passport, gets on a plane, flies to France, then flies to Mexico. And he shaves off his beard, leaves his mustache, and he looks just like a Mexican male. And then he crosses the border illegally and he either starts or forms a terrorist cell. And, and, and human trafficking, especially child human trafficking, you know, um, children will come across the border unaccompanied by an adult and on our arms and black marks a lot they will have a phone number and so we get the children and we call the number on their arms and uh, you know oh, oh my daughter she's alive i thought she was dead oh can i have my daughter and so they come to pick up their child and we hand them over we hand over to children and a lot of the times it's not a family member it's a it's a child trafficker and then we lose another child so on a federal level we need a sensible immigration policy and i can't wait for that day to happen but the fact of the matter is we must protect the border we must use all of our power and resources to fight this but humane measures as well just looking at the numbers i mean it's appalling so Depending on the year, Texas is either first or second in veteran population. We go back and forth with California every year. We just happen to be the biggest one right now. So that's 1.2 million veterans that have chosen the great state of Texas to, to nest or, or to make their home. Uh, and Abbott recently gave $44 million to veterans, which sounds impressive. But when you do the numbers, it's only $31.40 per veteran. Public education level, we will spend $6,100 per child per year, but our veterans get $31 a year. And, it, it, and, you know, and that's the gross number because the Texas Veterans Commission, they, they basically subcontract that out to nonprofits. So the $31 is a, a gross number, not a net number, because when you outsource it to nonprofits, then you have that administration and that bloat and those inefficiencies. And and I know we're going to talk about the, the Sunset uh, Advisory Commission, but I looked at the lottery. Uh, the lottery, Texas State Lottery, recently went through the process, and it turns out that, and this is a multi-billion dollar pie, veterans get 0.3% of the lottery proceeds. And then there's an asterisk and other agencies and programs. So the veterans have to split that 0.3% with other programs. In fact, uh, the people who sell the lottery tickets make more money off of the lottery system than veterans do. We, we will write a check for a million dollars because you sold a winning lottery ticket. That's just nonsense. I'd like to get in there and get the actuals on what we're doing for veterans. And I think that we can do certainly a lot more than $31 a year. Um, so the, the importance is it's sort of like the state watchdog, if you will. It's, it's to monitor the financials and legal and regulatory compliance of Texas agencies and programs. And periodically they have to go through that. And I want to be involved because I, I went through a report on a lottery commission and a lot of it just looked rubber stamped. Give me the lottery commission and I'll, I'll trim a lot of fat off of that. And that's why I want to be involved. And I think that's true of, of, of most of our agencies and programs. You know, the bureaucracy, the overhead, the inefficiencies, money just thrown everywhere for whatever reason. And I think that the Texas, Texas state needs to be more fiscally responsible for the windfall of revenues that we take in. Well, the biggest issue in my district is school vouchers. And I, I oppose school vouchers, period. I simply won't, according to Abbott. If you if you could look at the state politics in in terms of school vouchers, the Republicans that didn't vote for Abbott's uh, program, they ran other candidates against the Republicans, and it's ugly. It's it's just ugly the way that on um, the school voucher uh, uh, controversy went down. It was mean and it was nasty and it was personal. My incumbent lost the Republican runoff. And he was absolutely personally crucified. You know, 
the whole time, all because he didn't vote for school vouchers. And he, you know, he's Republican. And as a matter of disclosure, I started out life as a Republican. I've been a libertarian for about 10, 15 years. I, I even volunteered for the uh, Tarrant County GOP uh, for a couple of years. That party, Democrats, some of them too, they have a cult-like quality to them. And in the Republican Party, there's MAGA and non-MAGA. Then you have the Democrats and all of their caucuses. And, and it's not just reflective of my local race, but national politics as well. We are severely, severely divided right now. And, you know, we, we have to restore our dignity and have some integrity so the constituents will trust us again. And, you know, the school vouchers, it's just... You know, I have a romantic uh, idea about public education because I'm a product of, of a K-12 education. And any way you slice it, it's, it's bad for the state and bad for our children. I, I talk to educators, uh, unlike healthcare, educators will talk to me all day long. So I talk to superintendents, the principals, the administrative staff, teachers, all of them. And, and they're really scared right now. I mean... Public schools are the cornerstones of our community. When we build a school, here comes the subdivisions, and here comes the families, and the teachers, and the oil change place, and the gas station, and a myriad of retailers, and it goes on and on. We tinker with our public school system, and we get it wrong, thus goes the community. And I'm hearing from teachers right now that the charter school program is actually cannibalizing the public schools. One teacher told me uh, 300 student seats were lost to charter schools alone in his school. And that's, that's devastating. And also, I, I morally, I think it's absolutely wrong to collect a constituent's tax dollar and then use it to send somebody else's kid to private school. And, and so I'm not going to give up on, on the public school system. So when a, when a ship is listing, you don't scuttle it, you right the ship. And, you know, as big and great as we are, with all the talent that we have out there and, and the good public servants, there's an answer to the public school dilemma, you know? We, we, but we would rather just throw money into another program rather than fixing what we have. And what we have is, is substantial. And we're not the worst school system in the country. If you want to see bad school systems, just look to our neighbors, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and New Mexico. I think it's a worthy and noble fight to, to fight for our children, to fight for our public schools.